Well, thank you very much and good morning, everyone. It's um, a great pleasure for me to be at a conference which is being organized by the father of the Global Green Growth Institute. Always an honor to meet my father. Um, Vice Minister Cho Te Yul talked about the very lively debates in this country over the past few weeks about emissions trading and whether Korea should do emissions trading or not. And for me, that debate is both completely comprehensible and completely incomprehensible at the same time. I find the debate completely comprehensible because, of course, Korean industry leaders are concerned about the competitiveness of the Korean economy uh, at a time when the global economy is not doing great. Uh, Korean business leaders are concerned about negatively affecting Korean competitiveness, of pushing the cost of production up as a consequence of a price on carbon. So in that sense, I find the debate completely comprehensible. At the same time, I find the debate completely incomprehensible because it is symptomatic of, of something which I also quite often see in the United States, which is the idea that climate change is a standalone issue and that climate change is somebody else's problem, not yours. If, if I look at climate change, it, it comes in a gamut of issues that, that relate to climate, to energy prices, to energy security, to material price increases, to water scarcity, to food scarcity, to biodiversity loss, to deforestation, all driven by population increase, wealth increase, and urbanization. And out of those 10 issues, Tell me one that Korea is not affected by, either nationally or on a global scale. In other words, if these challenges are real, and if climate change is one of these challenges, then actually transforming the Korean economy, the global economy, to cope with those challenges, to turn those challenges into opportunities by making the economy more creative is actually what we should be focusing on. The industrialized countries built the wealth that they enjoyed today based on the muscles of their people. If Korea builds its economy in the future, it will build it on the minds, not the muscles of the Korean people. In a recent interview, I was asked what I thought was the main problem around climate politics in Korea. And my answer was that I think the main problem around climate politics in Korea is that in this country, you can only be president once and you can only be president for five years. Now, why did I identify that as the major problem? I identified that as the major problem because addressing climate change and addressing those other issues I talked about requires a massive structural adjustment which will take decades and which will require upfront costs in order to reap significant benefits later. And there are very, very few politicians, whether they're Korean or Dutch or Chinese or American, that are willing to confront their population with a high cost before the elections on the promise that their successor will bring great benefits after the election because they know it is the successor that will reap the benefits. So the short-termism of, polit of, of, of politics is, is very difficult to match with this long-term structural adjustment, a structural adjustment that is going to have to get us away 
from the situation where a value of a company is determined solely by the cash that it returns to its shareholders and valued not at all in terms of the economic, the social and environmental benefits that that company creates for society. Now, what is the role of the Paris Agreement in that context? Because that's what we're supposed to be talking about, not macroeconomics. <clears throat> to my mind, the climate process really constitutes a classical prisoner's dilemma in that we are firmly in the grasp of the vested interests that stem from the old economy, the people that are sitting on all of that oil and gas and coal that Dr. Lee talked about. We are firmly in the grasp of the vested interests of the old economy and no one really dares to lead for fear of, look, of losing economic advantage, which goes back to the debate in Korea on emissions trading. So to my mind, the main added value of a climate process is to help economies around the world move forward in step, in a synchronized way, while preserving something that everybody talks about but that doesn't exist, namely the level playing field. I very much think about Paris in terms of, of course, what it must conclude, but I also think of Paris in terms of what it must launch. What Paris must conclude is an international agreement to address climate change and to launch a process to limit average global temperature increase to two degrees centigrade. And I say launch because no one at this table has indicated the expectation that Paris in one fell swoop will bring us the final answer on limiting temperature increase to two degrees centigrade. That will be a longer process that will take more time. And in order for Paris to do that successfully, to put that process in place, it needs to do four things. First of all, I think Paris needs to include commitments by all countries and a commitment on the part of all countries to translate that commitment into national law. Because I actually think that national law is much stronger than international law. I actually think that the Korean emission trading scheme survived the debate that you've seen in this country because it was actually put into law two years ago. And it is much more difficult for political leaders of today to say we are going to conveniently change the law than to modify a decision. So my first point is commitments by all countries and the commitment to write those commitments into national law. And my hope is that that would also be a much more palatable approach to the United States than the notion that the United Nations or some other international body is going to impose a target on the United States because as we all know there is nothing between the Senate and heaven. My second point would be that we need Paris to agree a process to regularly review both the adequacy of commitments because the commitments will not be good enough and the adequacy of the implementation of commitments. In other words, since we will not reach two degrees in Paris in terms of implementation, we need a process of regular review. The third thing which I think Paris needs to deliver is a decision to also regularly review the financial needs of developing countries and to review, discuss and decide how those financial needs are going to be met. The $100 billion per year that is in the Copenhagen Accord was plucked out of a hat. And I can say that because I plucked it out of my hat. There is no science, no economics that underpins the $100 billion per year. In other words, we will need to come to a more exact calculation of what financial needs are in different parts of the world and how those financial needs can be met. 
And the fourth thing which I think Paris needs to do is to launch a series of implementing agreements, something which I'll return to. So the agreement part of Paris and the launch part of Paris are intimately connected. In launch terms, I think it is very important that Paris establishes an implementation process. And this is significant because it is only by countries moving forward in step that that so-called level playing field can be maintained. So countries need to understand each other in terms of moving forward. And I believe that in that context, implementation agreements can be very important. Professor Stevens talked about harmonized national policies. I think that that is a very important remark. Going into the Kyoto negotiations, yes, I've seen the Time's Up sign, thank you. Um, going into the Kyoto negotiations, what Europe wanted was an agreement on policies and measures. We wanted agreements on how to regulate the energy industry, the cement industry, the steel industry, pulp and paper, etc. The United States didn't want policies and measures. The United States wanted targets and timetables. The United States is big and strong and intelligent, so we took out the policies and measures. We put in the targets and timetables. The United States walked away from the Kyoto Protocol, and this is where we are today. I think that policies and measures, implementation agreements, could be a very significant part uh, of the solution. And in the context of those implementation agreements to perhaps bring a different group of people to the table. At the moment, the climate change negotiations are still very heavily dominated by people from ministries of environment. And I think those people are doing a great job. But to really come to implementation over time, we will need to put this debate in the hands of ministers of finance and in the hands of ministers of economic affairs, because they will have to understand the economics of what is eventually agreed. Now, the climate process, to my mind, at the moment, has a serious case of a very unpleasant disease called elephantitis. At every conference of parties, more and more people attend, more and more issues are added to the agenda, and more and more complexity is introduced. A few years ago, Sarah Palin, who was hoping to become a president of the United States, talked about <coughs> snake oil science. I'm actually much more concerned about a voodoo policy process. I believe the challenge is to cut through complexity and to find that political core, whether it's my four points or four different ones. And it is in finding that political core that Ban Ki-moon's summit in a few weeks' time can be incredibly important. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.